My guest today is Dr. Cal Newport. He has never, ever been on social media before. It seemed like they were engineered to really distract you because even early on, this was clear that social media made money off your attention. There has to be other reasons why you kept saying no, no, no to social media. No one really had a good reason why I should be signing up for it. That definitely caught my attention. Wouldn't you see TV as a distraction similar to what social media would be? I was really starting to get concerned when I saw people constantly pulling their attention down to that phone. And it, yet it also seemed to be capturing so much of people's time and attention that for someone who made a living with my brain, I was very, very wary about this. There is a benefit to social media, even for a guy like you, what you think is social media. When I'm using the term, I'm thinking about attention economy platforms where your data, time, and attention is the primary product to sell. There's a part of me that fully agrees with you. The way I think about things through my digital minimalism perspective is there's not something I really value in life for which any of those platforms is a really big win. My guest today is Dr. Cal Newport, who got his PhD from MIT. I whispered to him earlier, I said, I learned how to spell MIT in my 30s. So again, PhD from MIT has written seven books, two of which are New York Times bestsellers. He has tens of millions of views on social media, on YouTube. There's only one kicker. He has never, ever been on social media before. We're going to find out today that in the next 60 minutes, can we convince this man to open up a Facebook and a Twitter profile. No one's been successful yet. Let's see if we can pull it off or not. With that being said, Cal, thank you so much for being a guest on Valuetainment. Yeah, thanks for having me on. Let's uh, yeah, let's see if you can get me over to the dark side. I highly doubt that's going to happen. You seem pretty convinced where you're at, and I think it's even deeper rooted in some of the set of values and principles and on the way you live. But I think the question today is really going to be how many people you can convert to get, come to your dark side, to get off of... Uh, Maybe not dark side to be enlightenment. I think it's more, you're probably more free than those that are on social media having to check 70 apps every single day. So why don't we go all the way back? So, uh, you know, one of the biggest challenges for all of us is that, hey, I'm on Facebook. You got to get on. What's Facebook? Dude, just get on. Okay, I'll get on Facebook. Hey, I'm on MySpace. You got to get on. What's MySpace? Dude, it's sick. You got to get on. Hey, have you looked at Twitter? You got to get on. Okay. How did you say no to all of those temptations every time people said you got to get on a social media platform? You know, Facebook was the first. And the way I remember it, it was the spring of 2004, right? I was a college senior, the spring of 2004. Back then, Facebook was going university to university. It was still sort mm -hmm. of in a beta stage. So it came, to, it came to where I was. I was at Dartmouth College. And I remember my friends and my girlfriend and everyone was sort of into it, right? They're like, oh, it's the Facebook.com. It's sort of like, the literal Facebooks we have, but but virtual. And there was like an arbitrary reason why I didn't sign up. And my memory of the arbitrary reason was I don't like listing favorites. It's a weird tick I have. <laughs> if you tell me what's your favorite book, what's your favorite movie, I, for whatever reason, I, I, I just can't do that. I have an aversion to it. And early Facebook, this is what the profiles were centered on is you would list your favorite quotes, you would list your favorite movies. So for an arbitrary reason, it's like, oh, I don't want to do that. Wow. That accident, though, gave me this interesting, almost anthropological separation. You know, like I was Margaret Mead studying studying a, a tribes on an island or something. So I was separated from social media as it began to spread. And after a while, just observing it from the outside to me became way more interesting than actually being in it. So it was an accident that got me started down this path. So, okay, fine. So you decided not to get on your favorite. And that was kind of like your, your thing. But... I mean, from 04 to 2021, there's been 17 years for 7 billion something people in the world to convince you to get on social media and you still haven't done it. So what there has to be other reasons why you kept saying no, no, no to social media. What was that? What was that reason? Well, so after I graduated college in 2004, I went to MIT and I was not only in the computer science department, but I was in the theory group within the computer science department. So this is the group in which you have all the theoretical computer scientists. So we literally stare at whiteboards and try to solve math proofs. In this really unusual kind of idiosyncratic type of professional environment, focus was everything. Like your ability to, to maintain focus was really highly prized. People did not spend much time engaging with the outside world. It wasn't reading a lot of news. It was I'm locked in trying to solve proof. So 
I went from college into this environment where what people really cared about is how hard can you focus? And when I was in that setting, to expose myself to tools that seemed like they were engineered to really distract you, because even early on, this was clear that social media made money off your attention. It's being engineered to get as much attention as possible. We all looked at it with great suspicion. So I didn't sign up for arbitrary reasons. And then once I was in this unusual professional environment, it became really suspicious of why would I bring one of these tools into my life? It seems like it's going to get in the way of what I'm doing. It would be like a professional athlete looking at cigarettes and saying, you know, I don't really want to bring these into my life because I make a living off my lung capacity. Do you have a TV? Do you have TV in your house? Yeah, we have, uh, we have TVs. My wife and I are cinephiles. We like to watch movies. So we have that. So uh, wouldn't you see TV as a distraction and as cigarettes uh, uh, similar to what social media would be? Well, so the issue I had with social media was twofold. One, no one really had a good reason why I should be signing up for it. That definitely caught my attention. It was like, because it's here. And I'm like, okay, but what do you do on the facebook.com? Like, well, you know, you, you see like who your roommates, boyfriends are dating or something. And I'm like, well, that's not interesting to me. Well, why should I sign up for this? No one was really giving me a good reason. Whereas if you look at a TV and say, there's a great movie and you can watch it on this screen, I'll say, well, that's a pretty compelling reason. And two, it became clear pretty early on that these platforms had a lot of energy being invested into making them as sticky as an experience as possible. They had the ability to manipulate your attention, to manip manipulate your emotional centers, to, to manipulate your social centers. They get you to look at these things much longer than you knew was useful or much longer than you knew was healthy in a way that you couldn't really replicate with something that was as asymmetric and static as television. So I was really starting to get concerned when I saw people with these networks following them everywhere they went and was constantly pulling their attention down to that phone, right? So there seemed to be something new going on. So we had these platforms where no one could really explain why I needed to be on it. And it, yet it also seemed to be capturing so much of people's time and attention that for someone who made a living with my brain, I was very, very wary about this. It, uh, uh, just out of curiosity, Cal, Cal, who were you in high school? If I was in high school with you, 14 years old, 15 years old, who was Cal? Um, in high school, I was, I ran track, uh, I was a smart kid, but but maybe not considered like a one of the brains. I uh, had a long-standing group of friends I'd had since elementary school. I mean, I was relatively popular. Went to the parties. Uh, by my senior year, I was a little bit unusual. By my senior year, I was running my own tech company, a sort of a, a web development consulting firm with a friend of mine that was doing pretty well. And I ran out of computer science classes to take, so I would drive to nearby. Princeton University to take their computer science classes. So there are some things that started to set me apart as I got a little bit uh, older in my high school experience, but I was a relatively sort of semi-popular normal kid, I would say. What, what, uh, is, as far as being raised by your family, what set of values and principles were you raised on? Well, I mean, one thing my family always valued was the brain as an asset and intellectual life as one to aspire to. You know, my, my dad had a doctorate and had been a professor for a while. My grandfather, his dad had a doctorate and was a professor for a while. Uh, there was something we used to hear stories. My dad would tell stories of like Richard Feynman, you know, the famous quantum physicist. Uh, we would hear about John von Neumann. Uh, so we, we really respected the life of the mind and using your brain to create things that was new and valuable. That was definitely in the air when I was growing up, which is why I ended up going to MIT, why I ended up wow. going to the theory group is... I love that idea of the John Nash beautiful mind drawing on the window, solving things with just your brain. That was definitely something that had always attracted me. That's so, that's so interesting. Now, how about values wise? Were you a church corn family? Were you a religious family? Did you guys follow a certain code or, you know, commandment? Were there a certain set of values that the family followed? Uh, growing up, we were Presbyterian. Okay. My, my dad had been raised Southern Baptist. So for example, uh, there's no cursing. Right. That, that was something I really noticed is like in our family, there was no cursing. I still rarely curse to this day because I just didn't grow up, for example, uh, around it. My parents didn't drink alcohol. That was another thing. I think that came from the, the Southern Baptist upbringing. So I, I had both those threads certainly all around me from a value perspective. Got it. So so and, and did that continue on into your teens and young adult and as an adult yourself? Like, have you continued a lot of those traditions yourself? Uh, well, well, certainly not the no drinking. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I will enjoy I will enjoy a good lager uh, now and then. But yeah, I, I would say 
definitely have a, a strong foundation of values. Like I'm very interested in religion and theology. I'm very interested in moral philosophy. I take very seriously having a code and a set of values. I actually, what I do, and, and I recommend this a lot to my readers is I have a lit, here's my values and, and you should have them. It should be written down, right? And you should review it. And I, I often tell my listeners and my readers, like review these every week. And, and I'll actually create, I call it a value plan every week little notes. Hey, here's what I'm working on this week, right? You know, I think I'm kind of falling short on this, or here's something I might want to punch up. And I write it as part of my weekly plan. Okay, here's the, I call it the VP, the value plan. So I see it as something that I'm constantly working on, because it's really core, I think, to resilience more than anything else. Life's going to knock you down a bunch. That's the, that's the ground that you're going to fall on. So you want to keep that ground pretty firm. And this is all going to a place here. The only reason I'm asking this is because I'm going to a place with this. I'm not just asking it for entertainment purposes, although it's very enlightening to see how you were raised. So recap, pops, doctor, grandpa, PhD, and that lineage keep goes up. In your family, the life of a mind, you guys respected the mind, no cursing, certain set of values, review your value on a weekly basis. Were there any other set of values? Or like if I'm, my dad would say, never be afraid of the truth, Okay. And he would say, rather than learning how to fight with your, uh, uh, you know, uh, fi- you know, with your hands, why don't you learn how to fight with your mind and your mouth, right? Learn, yeah. go do your, so you can, what were some of the things you were taught in your family growing up? Well, you know, another value I think was, that was unusual to our family was independent thinking and to be concerned about ideology, right? So, so one of the unusual things I grew up in is uh, my dad's job, most of the time I was growing up he was the the editor in chief of the Gallup poll, right? The public opinion pollsters, which meant that publicly he had to be very nonpartisan because they did all the the election polling and and approval polling. He lived that in and outside of the house. So in our house, there was no notion of partisanship. There's no notion of we're for this party. And so now what we're going to do around the party is talk about how the other party is bad. Everything came from a a place of detached uh, observation. Well, the people who support this candidate, like they're kind of thinking about this and the people over here, well, they think about this. It was all sort of detached. And so I think it was really, yeah. it was pretty rare, especially today. But to this day, it is very difficult. I'm very wary. And maybe this is also because I don't use Twitter, which might <laughs> push me into more of tribal thinking, but I'm very wary of tribal thinking. I'm very wary of ideological thinking where you, you fix your team and then work backwards from Let's defend our team and not give too much ground to the other team. That is very foreign to me, but I think that attitude is actually that I have is pretty foreign to most people. And it's because of that unusual upbringing where there was no partisanship in our house. Right. I mean, you have to realize uh, the way you're raised is one in a million. Okay. The the way you're raised is not very common. So I'm asking this question because uh, your parents must have done a very good job raising you guys to the point where don't make a decision just to please everybody else and you know, don't follow the crowd. If somebody's doing cocaine or pot or ecstasy or whatever, you don't need to do just because they're doing it, question it, make, think for yourself. A lot of those set of values, you know, respect in the brain, but alcohol came to you later on. So if your parents weren't for you to drink in alcohol, it's not like your 100% loyalty is not to do what your parents tell you to do because you do drink alcohol. So then why social media? Like, and then you're saying, I didn't see any value on being on social media, but I know a lot of people that are on social media they use it as a method where they're on Instagram. They only follow 28 people and only 28 people follow them. They don't get any advertising on Instagram. They see pictures of what the 28 people that they love the most are doing. And they get to post pictures and videos of the people, the 28 people that they want to see what they're doing. So there is a benefit to social media, even for a guy like you. Why, why would you think 100% of what social media offers isn't good? Because you can tr- turn off the triggers and all the advertising and the way that Facebook, Instagram, Twitter tries to trigger your mind. You can control that. But why still say no to social media on the positive sides that it offers to you? Well, I'd flip that around and say, why spend all that time? Like, w- what, what is the big win I'm going to, you know, to spend all this time trying to set up triggers and reconfigure uh, unless I have a compelling reason. Oh, this solves a big problem for me. Watching I'm a movie doesn't gonna... solve a problem for you, though. Well, I enjoy the, I enjoy the format. I enjoy the medium, you know, I, I, I enjoy, I enjoy movies. Right. Uh, you know, I don't, to me, I see it like some people like bike riding. Right. And uh, so I won't say, uh, uh, I get that you really enjoy bike riding. Uh, it's very enjoyable, but I don't happen to 
like bike riding. That's not one of the things I do, but I did actually write a whole book about how you should make these decisions. So, so back in 2019, I, I wrote a book called Digital Minimalism, where this was the question, how do you figure out the use of technology in your personal life? And, and the answer to that book was not, here's the good things and here's the bad things. No one should use social media. Everyone should use watch movies or whatever. The philosophy that came out of that book was essentially what's important here is working backwards from what you value, what you care about, your vision of what you want your life to be like. Once you're really set what's important to you in your life, then you can work backwards and say, what's the best way to use technology to amplify these things I care about? And I had 1,600 people go through this experiment where they got rid of all the technology, all the optional technology in their personal life, spent a month really reflecting, what do I care about? What do I want my life to be like? And then rebuilding their digital life from scratch. About 50% of them had social media as part of that answer. So to me, what's important is not what tech is good and what tech is bad. It is, are you deploying tech intentionally? Oh, here's something I care about. You know, uh, I'm an artist. And there's these other artists who put their works in progress on Instagram. And seeing other artists in my field's works in progress is crucial to my creative process. So yes, I use Instagram for this purpose. That's fantastic, right? That's deploying technology intentionally to support things you really care about. And so that philosophy, which I call digital minimalism, is what I've really been pushing. Now, for me, when I go through the things that are important to me and I want to spend time on, and I use tech in a lot of intentional ways, social media just hasn't made the cut, right? There's, there's no particular thing in my particular life that this is very important to me where social media is a really good way of using tech to benefit it. So it's not in my life. But for other people, they answer that question differently. I care about how people ask it, not necessarily the answers that they end up with. So can you tell me what you think is social media? So maybe say this company, that company, this company is social media. What is social media to you? You know, typically when I'm using the term, I'm thinking about attention economy platforms where your data, time, and attention is the primary product, the primary thing they're extracting to sell. Uh, and I, I make a distinction between social media and the social internet. I'm a big early booster of the internet and the social internet. I think using the internet for expression and connection is very important. So it's really that attention manipulation aspect. It's a large platform, closed garden, trying to extract, monetize your data, your attention. So that would be, uh, you know, it's hard to keep up with, but the classics would be Facebook, it'd be Twitter, it would be Instagram, it would be TikTok. On the other hand, things like there's, there's really hazy dividing lines. Instant messenger services, probably not. Okay. Like WhatsApp, right? WhatsApp is sort of, they, they're trying to be more like a a social network, but it's it's in its own sort of in-between sure. space, for example. Uh, group text messages is not. Obviously, things like being on a podcast or something is not, right? YouTube, I don't know how to think about it, you know, I, because YouTube is a very complicated thing. It is the best. Video is incredibly important. It's a great platform for it. But they have this recommendation engine, which is trying to grab your attention. But it so, like, I think YouTube is in a weird space, right? So it's not super clear cut. Some things are. I think Twitter is pretty clear cut. I think Facebook's pretty clear cut. I don't know how to think about YouTube. I don't know how to think about WhatsApp. You know, uh, I don't know how to think about Clubhouse. Like, what what is Clubhouse? I don't really know. I'm doing a Clubhouse, you know, shortly at, with a, a a tech reporter from the New York Times to see what it is because I don't even know what that is. So it's not an easy question to answer. Got it. So do you watch YouTube? I mean, not a lot, but I'm fascinated by YouTube because I think democratizing video is incredibly important, and it seems to be really the only game in town, right? If I'm understanding, obviously you, you're a master of the medium. There really isn't a, is this true? There's not really a comparable platform that makes it, uh, that's so good at uh, hosting video and displaying video and you can play it on all these different uh, tablets and TVs and phones. And um, so, yeah, I, I use I use YouTube often like a library when I'm trying to look something up or want to see. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Or there's a, a, someone I'm interested in, I want to see them interviewed. Um, I, you know, so I'm very interested in YouTube. I don't, I don't know quite how to think about it, but I, I think it's something very important happening there. Well, you, you seem very uh, sincere and almost like an innocent way of thinking and a very clear set of, uh, uh, uh standards on what you, uh, uh, classify as social media or not. Some would say YouTube is a social media company, second largest, you know, on traffic, et cetera, et cetera. And you're right. There's not necessarily a comparable to them. Vimeo, some of these other companies, Facebook may say, yes, we are a direct competitor of YouTube, maybe on short clips. Facebook's not big on long form. Like you're not going to see too many three hour podcasts on Facebook. Instagram may say we also get on the short uh, videos, one minute, two minute, five minute, 10 minutes. 
not necessarily our type of thing. So, so then that uh, uh, goes back to Twitter, Facebook, Instagram being ones that you have a challenge with. And it's, is it mainly because they get to dictate what you watch next and they're able to trigger and kind of manipulate the whole thing to say, hey, Cal, you like this? Let me feed you some more of this. Hey, like the whole Social Dilemma documentary. I'm assuming that's the part that you uh, uh, don't see any value in using those social media platforms. Is that a good uh, 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 way of putting it? Well, I mean, I want to I want to put it so starkly. So, so again, the way I think about things through my digital minimalism perspective is there's not something I really value in life for which any of those platforms is a really big win. The thing I, I'm very wary of is what in, in another book I wrote I call the any benefit mindset. I think especially with tech, it's very dangerous to approach tech from the as, the mindset of could there be some value here? If so, why don't I try it? In some settings, that's okay. It's nice to explore, but because of the things you're talking about, that's a dangerous decision in the world of the social media networks because innocently, let me just like do some Instagram might end up being seven hours a day. It might end up being, uh, I am on this way more than I think it's useful, way more than I think is healthy. So the, you have to be a little bit more wary with these platforms because they are very good at grabbing your attention once they're there. So I keep coming back to, look, if there's a big win, I'll use it, but it could be interesting. You could find some new readers. There might be something interesting. That's not going to be compelling enough for me, especially when there's so many of these attention traps that have been engineered into the services. So I'm very wary. Cal, do any of your family members uh, uh, use social media? Probably. Yeah. I'm not sure which platforms, but I mean, I think I'm the only person between the age of 20 and 45 left in this country uh, who doesn't use social media. So I think I can confidently, I think I'm it, I, you know, I mean, I, I think when they have board meetings at Facebook and they have audience acquisition charts, there's only one thing left on it, which is a picture of me. <laughs> All right. We're almost done. We're almost done. <laughs> we got so so where do you, where do you keep pictures? Where do you keep pictures of family like albums? Uh, on my phone. So, which, which by the way, is I think a, probably a strategic mistake that was made by the major platforms is starting around 2012 to 2015, they said, we're going to shift the way from the original premise, which is this is a place to connect with people, you know, and we're going to switch instead towards a newsfeed model. We are going to use algorithmic information to get you a steady stream of things that's going to be engaging to you. And a lot of people just migrated things like sharing photos with their family. They're like, well, fine, I'm not going to do this on Facebook. I'm going to do it on a group text message chain. I think ultimately that's probably going to be an issue for these platforms because if they lose their network effect advantage, if it doesn't matter to me whether or not my cousin is on Facebook because I can just send him a picture of my kids on iMessage, now Facebook's advantage, why I have to use that platform gets way reduced. Once it becomes just a source of entertainment, yeah, it's a stream of stuff that algorithms are selecting that's engaging. It's competing with every other for, uh, form of entertainment out there, much more competitive landscape. Cal, what do you do for fun outside of watch TV and movies? Well, I mean, I only have so much time. I have three young kids, <laughs> three young kids and a couple jobs. So uh, I don't have a ton, I would say, of downtime. I do, as you might imagine, read quite a bit since that is uh, my life as a writer, you know, depends on consuming and producing the written word. So I do read quite a bit, um, but I'm not someone who has quite a bit of downtime. Do you document a lot of what your kids do with videos and save them? No, not really. It doesn't have a value for you? Yeah, we don't, I mean, we, we, uh, we'll share pictures and videos in the moment with family members. I think that would be more, uh, the more way we do it. Um, but we're not of the old, the old school of the camcorder <laughs> and building up the, building up the, the library, the library of tapes. When, when you said in 04, when the Facebook came out and it was kind of making the rounds through school to see who's dating who. And he said, my girlfriend and I, is your, is that girlfriend of yours now your wife? Yes. So, so you guys have been together for over 17 years. Yeah, we actually, we just had our uh, 20 a year. Yeah, our 20 year because we started dating before that. So we just hit our, we hit our 20 year anniversary. Congratulations. <laughs> uh, last week. Yeah. And is her personality like yours? What, what's her personality like? Uh, you know, she has her own thing. She's not weird like me. Yeah. <laughs> you know, thank God she has her own personality. Um, uh, no, it's different. She has her own thing going on. And but both of you guys are on the same page of not using social media. Um, she does whatever she does. I mean, I'm not going to tell her or anyone what tech they should or shouldn't use. The main things I write about is 
what is my suggestion for how you make those decisions? That's the main thing I care about. So Again, does, I don't have a list of good and bad tech. Does she use social? I don't know. I think she might have a Facebook account. I'm not quite sure. I mean, again, we're both pretty busy with the kids and everything. How you're else married going on. to your wife, you 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 would know if she's on Facebook. No, I don't know if she uses Facebook or not. I think she has an account, but I don't know. I I don't think she. But if she does, I don't think she spends much time on it. Got it. So I, I ask because, uh, you know, look. Okay, so one part on what you're saying. Um, I took a 90 day break from YouTube four years ago. Let me tell you, it felt like a million. I mean, I can't even say a million bucks because a million bucks doesn't feel that big. It felt like unlimited supply of freedom for 90 days. Okay. When I said, I'm not going to post, I don't want to create content. I don't want to do interviews. I don't want to do more. I don't want to do this. Get that camera away from me. It felt amazing. No joke. It felt amazing. So sometimes when I watch these guys like a Johnny Carson or a Jay Leno or a Jimmy Fallon or a Jimmy Kimmel or a David Letterman. I'm like, oh my gosh, what a life to go 20, 30 years and you got to be on that camera nonstop and fake it even though you just got into a bad fight with your wife and you're going through a divorce or your kid just got caught smoking weed or your mom just passed away or your dad, you do. Wow, what a, a amount of pressure to have to fake and act for that long of a time. So there's a part of what you're saying I get. When Facebook first came out, I didn't even want to get online because I'm the private guy. I'm the guy that you never knew who I dated. I was like, you know, Pat's, Pat's always got a girl, but we just don't know. Who, who are you with today? Who are you? Like, dude, I don't really want to advertise who I'm dating. I'm good with who I'm at. I'm, we're having a good time together. But if you see me out there, I'll introduce her to you, but it's not something I want to advertise. So there's a part of me that fully agrees with you and can see that direction. There's another part of me that's, sees it as another form of entertainment where strategically you can control on how to use it. You know, like back in the days, a lot of people were worried about radio or, or Elvis's song. Hey, you know, oh my gosh, you're moving your hips too much. And all girls are thinking about is sex and this is not good. Our daughters are going to start having sex with hundreds of men. And this is not the direction we're going. You know, what about this hip hop music? Look at this. Why is you know, Tupac and Biggie and all these guys, why are they cursing so much? And why are they saying this kind of, this is not good. And, you know, it allows us to make the choice to do what we want to do. The way you've taken it, you've taken it to a whole different level. Now, maybe this is a question that I'd be curious to know what you, what you would say to this. Do you think you will ever get on social media? Like, do you think there'll ever come a moment where you'll say, I think it makes sense for me to open up an account now? Or do you think you'll never do it? Well, I mean, first thing I'm going to push back a little bit on the analogy, right? Because, I mean, let's imagine rock and roll music is is sweeping through the country in the 50s and 60s, uh, and there's somebody who says, "Look, I'm a I'm a classical guy. I don't really like rock and roll. Whatever, you know. I, I, I I'm into the piano. I think these chord progressions are too simplistic, or whatever it is, right? That would be fine." And we want to go and say to that person, like, no, you have to listen to rock and roll music. You, you're not allowed to, to dislike rock and roll music. When the person's like, look, I'm just into music appreciation. I write books about music appreciation. That, I think, would be the right analogy here, right? So uh, for me to say, I don't see a lot of value in social media for what I'm doing right now uh, is not an indictment on the existence of the technology, right? Uh, just like I was saying with the bike riding analogy before, um, I'm happy if someone's really friends who are really in the bike riding. I think it's a cool sport. But if they really started bothering you, like, Cal, why don't you bike ride? Don't you see that this is going to make you healthy and has these advantages or whatever? It's like, look, just because I'm not doing it, I'm not trying to put down that you do. But I'm not out there saying uh, we should burn bikes. Right? Oh, you've never now, said if, that. No, I, don't, I don't think that's, yeah. I don't think that's yeah. the position you hold. Yeah, yeah. But just, just to, to set that platform. So, so what I end up, yeah, because I'm a digital minimalist. I mean, again, the way I, I come at things is uh, do less, do more, do better, right? So I'm, I'm very intentional, and very picky. But I mean, think about the tech I do use. I, I, I like the strategic deployment of the tech when I see a big win. So like I have a blog, which I've had since 2007. Mm -hmm. That's been a big win for me. You know, I have this, this audience. I've developed my thinking. I've had an audience for 15 years now who's been a part mm -hmm. of my, been part of my uh, interactions. One of the reasons why I didn't need, for example, uh, to let's say go on Facebook, just to go back to that, another aspect here is that because I was an early adopter of tech, I sort of already had my own platform. Whereas if I didn't, right, if I wasn't so tech savvy, it would obviously have been much easier maybe to post on Facebook or Twitter because one of their advantages back then 
in that early web 2.0 days was we're easier just technically speaking. It's a pain to set up a WordPress and get a server or whatever. And I kind of already had that going. Uh, I've embraced podcasting, right? It's another tech that I've embraced, I thought, and, and it's been good. You know, I, I've been doing it since uh, last summer, but we're coming in on 2 million downloads. It's been a great way to, to interact with awesome. interact with fans. So, you know, absolutely, I think any technology that comes along could come through that process of thinking I do and say, you know what, this is going to be a big win for this thing I really care about. The existing platforms just haven't passed that threshold uh, for me yet. And it, because again, I'm very focused on the things I do. They haven't been a big win. I care a lot about distraction. So for me and my minimalist calculus, they haven't crossed that threshold. The only thing I would say, which uh, just to give credit to what you're saying before, is like there, there, I, I, it is right. I do have a, a, a sort of underlying antipathy here. And that does come from the social dilemma style attention manipulation. I'm also as an early internet booster I do not like this idea of taking something as democratic as the internet and then trying to build your own private versions that exist in server farms that you own. So I have a philosophical sort of techno utopian disagreement with that. So, so you are actually right that beyond just my minimalist analysis of what I use and don't use, there is a little bit of underlying antipathy. And I don't want to pretend like there's not. And those are the grounds on probably on which that antipathy is formed is I'm an early internet guy. I don't like this idea of trying to build your own private internet. And I don't like some of the attention manipulation things that, that some of these companies do. So that is there. And that is a general thing I'm concerned about. Um, but more generally, I've got, I, this is the way I think about tech. And so I podcast, I blog, I could certainly see something that we would you know, categorize as a social media platform entering my life. Uh, the, the key to me is the intention. Yeah, um, you're born on the same day as my best friend is born. Okay, you guys are identical. So weird how, how wiring I mean, I don't even know how much there is, you know, whether you're a Gemini or a Cancer, and I think you're maybe a Cancer on the day. You're on the cusp of yeah. it, right, and right in the middle of it. You and him are born on the same exact day. Uh, are, are you a crypto guy? Do, do, you, do you believe in uh, blockchain? Are you someone that says, I think crypto is going to go places? Oh, yeah, there's a can of worms. <laughs> um, I, I, uh, I, I know a lot about crypto. I taught a, I taught a doctoral seminar last year on some of the, the mathematics behind a lot of the the blockchain technologies. I'm not an expert. So I want to, be, I, I, all right, so I'll, I'll be careful. I'm not a real expert on the specific products and usage of this underlying technology, right? So I'm not deep in the weeds of exactly what's happening with non-fungible tokens and how Ethereum smart contract language, you know, is going to be different than what you can do on a more limited blockchain style language. Like I'm not really a, a, an applied expert. I do have a, my general skepticism Here's my, here's my, I'll put it, it's just, as long as we're being controversial on everything that people like, my general skepticism <laughs> about uh, the crypto future is that I think what we're learning from these various blockchains is that it is immensely useful to have some sort of shared ledger that we trust that can have especially interactive contract style entries that, that we can't go back and change it, right? I think the real promoters of the technology though, what, where I'm thinking is they're over, they're overestimating the degree to which people are distrustful though. And, and I just imagine a future in which, okay, let's say a big company, let's say Google, this is gonna give crypto people heartburn, says, yeah, we have a ledger. And no, it's not, it's not a crypto ledger. We're not doing proof of work. Like, you, you know, we're, we're, we're transparent about it. It would be very hard for us to kind of fake and go back and do and change the ledger. And we'd probably be caught if we did. And also why would we, and, uh, but just use this when you want your shared public ledger to build these apps. I just have the sense that for 95% of the applications that are being developed right now, people say like, yeah, I trust them enough. And their service is, it's an easier ledger to work with. It's faster. We don't have to do proof of work. We don't have to, you know, it gets rid of some of the weird hard edges. So um, what I think is going to happen is you have, the, there, there's this deep philosophical political core that helped push this technology. And I think there's going to be a wide audience that doesn't care so much about the deep political philosophical core. It's like, oh, this is just really useful having a universal shared ledger that doesn't change that you can build many different applications on top of. So there's, there's my prediction is that uh, the trust aspect is going to be uh, depreciated as we get more used to the value of having these universal shared ledgers. <laughs> That was what else, great. What else can I? What else can I destroy? What else can I uh, uh, destroy right now? That's going to get me yelled at by who, internet who, people. <laughs> who would have? Who would have taken the angle of going to the ledger as far as crypto goes? Whether you trust the ledger or not, what a lens you got! Like, 
uh, again, uh, one of your favorite games to play, uh, based on what you said, is your favorites, right? You love playing favorites. Like, what's your favorite? Okay. Yeah. Uh, is, is your favorite movie, like, The Beautiful Mind? Are you, like, one of those types of guys? Like, have you watched The Beautiful Mind or no? Yeah. yeah. What do you think about yeah. that movie? I, look, I like the book even better. I, look, I grew up on those books, like those guys the, and the women that had these brilliant minds. And I don't have that, but um, man, I aspire to it. I don't know why. Yeah, okay, I, just, yeah, just, I don't yeah. have that. What do you mean you don't have that? I mean, listen, I mean, because John, you're... John Nash got a Nobel for, for figuring out the yeah. sort of group dynamics. Like, I don't know, you know, <laughs> look, I'll tell you what knocked that out of me was going to MIT. I thought I was a smart guy. And then I went to this theory group and man, was I disabused of that notion because Seriously? it was- Seriously, are you being serious? Are you being sincere about this? I'm being sincere. There, uh, so one floor of this building at MIT, yeah. there were three MacArthur Genius Grant winners. So you're talking about genius. They're literally MacArthur Genius, Genius Grant winners and two Turing Award winners. I could see all those offices from my office. One of the first professors I met when I got there was, he became a professor at MIT at 19. 19. Became a professor, had a MacArthur at 19 as well. Uh, he was tenured at 21. Like he couldn't go with his grad students to get drinks because he wasn't old enough. I mean, it's crazy, right? So it's all relative, I guess. He couldn't go to get the park. He was with 19 his years old. Yeah, to have he drinks. He was 19. <laughs> wow. Uh, well, you know, for the rest of us geniuses, we look at you and and you you qualify as the way you see the world as a so how about investment wise? What do you think about mutual fund? What do you think about stocks? What do you think about real estate real estate as a source of an investment? Well, look, I'm one of these bogglehead efficient market hypothesis type nerds, right? That which is partially born out of I just don't have enough uh time and attention to think much more for it. So I'm a big Vanguard guy. I'm a, I'm a big passive guy. Uh, I, I, I'm not a big, I'm really worried about the, the Kruger-Dunning effect when it comes to investments, right? The most dangerous people when it comes to investments are people that are pretty smart because they're smart enough to believe, you know, I feel I'm smarter than most people. So especially in tech, we have this problem. I'm smarter than most people. So I can believe the hypothesis that I can figure out, you know, secrets in the market and, and stocks to invest in and, and make money on it because I'm smarter than other people, but not smart enough to realize that actually the, the people at these hedge funds and at these banks that are already working in the market spend their entire life studying this, right? And, and uh, it's an efficient market and there's not really, you're, it's being, you're flipping coins and you're, you're, getting, uh, you're getting too excited about gamblers ruin going in your direction for a while, right? So, uh, I mean, I find like smart tech people get in the most trouble with investments because they believe in themselves enough to believe in the idea that like, if I study stuff, I can figure out stuff the market hasn't realized yet. I can, I can figure out advantages in the pricing. So I'm all about, look, man, let's get this in a, let's get this in a Vanguard fund. Let's get this low expense ratio, let it ride. Uh, I always say, I'd rather spend more time trying to think how to make more money than spend that time trying to get a little bit more money out of what I already have. But then again, I'm infamous for being bad at money. So uh, don't take any of my advice around money <laughs> as, as something that you should follow because um, it's not my strong suit. Let's, let's talk about one of your books that you wrote, Deep Work, okay? Uh, Rules for Focus, Success in a Distracted World. Phenomenal subtitle, right? Uh, how do we stay focused you know, and succeed in a ridiculously distracted world today? Well, I think 80% of the value of that book is the title. Like, I'm, I'm a big believer in, you know, sometimes just having the right terminology opens up all the decisions you need to make, right? And, and when I was writing that book, I thought the big thing that was an issue is that we didn't divide different types of efforts into different types of efforts. We just like work was work, and I'm either busy or not, like how much am I doing? And like the main thing I was trying to argue there is let's break up work into two different types of categories, right? There's deep work where you're, you're doing one thing for a while without distraction and you're really thinking hard and there's everything else, the emails, the Zoom, the, the jumping back and forth on you know Slack or what have you. And it's not that the everything else is not important, it's what keeps the lights on, you have to submit your timesheet if you're gonna get paid, but it's not what moves the needle right? It's not where you create the new thing. It's not how you get promoted. It's not how your company grows. And so I said, once we realize there's two different things, now you can ask the question, well, how much of the, the deep work stuff am I doing? And once you knew how to measure, like what it was you were measuring, I just think a lot of people realized the answer was zero. And once you realize the answer was zero, the alarm bells go off and then you start to make changes. And, and in some sense, how you make the changes, I think is less important than you realize that it's a problem. And so just that term, 
that that is a particular type of effort, just putting that semantic distinction into the universe was probably 80% of the value of that book. Let me, let me ask you, you know, in, in this whole thing with deep work uh, and straight A method, you know, I think that's another book that I don't know if that's a book you wrote. I think that's a book that you wrote, right? Studying is a skill. If you get good at skill, you can learn how to get better. So what is your method of researching? I think the, the one skill that we all have to get better at today is researching. It's quite frankly, I don't think it's something that we give enough credit to and we don't talk about enough. You don't see a lot of guys online talking about, I'm the research expert. Here's how to go do research effectively. But I think like almost everybody I know that it's super, super successful in the world of business and investment, they're one of the best at their method of researching a topic and studying a topic. What is Definitely. your philosophy and approach to research? And by the way, even if you guys were taught at MIT and you were around all these other MacArthur geniuses that you learned from them, what did you learn as far as how to become a better researcher? Well, I think we've lost familiarity with thinking as an activity. You know, and it used to be something that there was, there's very few people for which thinking was relevant because there's very few, what we would call today, knowledge jobs, right? Like almost every job you would have involved moving, you know, a hoe through soil, right? Uh, or, or butchering a carcass or whatever. And the only people doing knowledge jobs were theologians and philosophers, and there's a few scientists and, and writers around, but they used to think a lot about thinking, what it feels like. It's hard, right? The, the way we talk about doing exercise, like we're, we're pretty used to like weights is hard and here's what it feels like and, and you get the burn and then there's a runner's high and all this type of stuff. It all exists for thinking. It's, it's uh, you're, you're applying cognitive energy to take information and move it into internally in your mind into a more useful structure. And it's difficult and there's strain but there's a euphoria when you make, when it clicks because your mind likes when things fit together. And we used to think a lot about thinking. Now that it's relevant to a lot of people, we haven't thought as much about it. And people just aren't that comfortable with what it feels like to think hard. It feels hard and then it feels good and you practice it and you get better at it. And, and, and it's a core activity. That's the way I approach research, right? Whether I'm talking about in computer science or whether I'm talking about in you know uh, my book or article writing, I see it almost like an athlete thinks about training. I think a lot about thinking. I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, try to understand this hard idea. You know, uh, yesterday I spent the, the morning yesterday trying to understand is about a half page of mathematics in a paper. Like if I need to understand what they're doing, if I could understand what they're doing, I might be able to use that for this related problem I'm working on. And it was just a couple hours of sitting at my whiteboard here in my my offices. And it's, okay, here's the math on the board. Why are they doing that? Come back to it. Okay, think about it, come back to it. Think about it, come back to it. That sort of just comfort with cognitive strain where you're putting your energy towards things that are a little bit beyond what's easy for you to understand, exerting cognitive energy to try to move that information to a more useful structure to build understanding. That is the, the axiomatic action of valuable knowledge production. It's something I think a lot about and I protect a lot about and I'm comfortable with and used to. I think a lot of people aren't. And it's something we should probably discuss more. Interesting. Crazy question for you. Um, if Plato, Aristotle, Socrates, I don't know, Friedrich Nietzsche, you, you take a Marcus Aurelius, Seneca, if all these guys were around today and their social media, which one of them wouldn't be on social media? All right. Let, that's a good question. Um, I don't know if Aurelius would be on social media. I think Socrates for sure would. Right, uh, because he would he would he would say this is great. What is Twitter if not a giant dialectical experience and <laughs> trying to find? Or or he would be terrified by it because actually okay. Um, let me let me reverse that. Socrates would have been an early user of Twitter, let's say, and then would have become a sharp anti-Twitter critic. Wow, this, this is this is what I'm going to say because because here's the thing, right? Like the the the. The Socratic method, like at the core of his approach to knowledge, right? He had this approach to knowledge in which you uh, clash ideas back and forth, and he did it through dialogue. And, and in this dialectical collision, you got deeper roots of understanding, and this is what all of his dialogues were like. And, and one of my critiques of Twitter has been that it's it's actually moved us away from that and towards a more like tribal notion of knowledge, where it's much more about my team thinks this, your team thinks that. Uh, so he would call it... Um, sophism back then right and all that matters is that you don't give ground to the other team like you want to find an angle to dunk on the other team and but whatever you do make sure you don't give ground that was really sophism which socrates was against and he was much more for this the socratic approach where, where you're like okay let me get the best possible argument against what i believe 
then collide that to how I believe, and in there I learn even more. So I think Socrates would be, would love the idea of a global discussion because we're all going to get smarter. And then he would see the way it tribalized and say, ah, it's a digital sophism, this is making things worse. So that's where I'll put down my chip. Socrates would be one of the earliest users and then one of the most, he would be the Tristan Harris of <laughs> the philosophers or something. He'd be really anti, anti-Twitter after he'd been there for a while. But Aurelius would have never gotten on it. I guess. I mean... Is it because he could care less for recognition? He's like, I don't need the recognition. I don't need to get the exposure. Is is that why the reason? Yeah, and and he was so intentional, right? And he was so intentional about like uh, this value-driven activity in his life. Um, But then again, you know, if you're an emperor or what have you, maybe it's useful because you can (laughs) reach your. It's these are weird. These are weird mix. If we brought him, you know, if he had Twitter back in that time, maybe it'd be useful for talking to your subjects or something. But he feels like someone that would be say like, uh, I don't know, this is not deep enough, right? Let's go, let's go write poetry. I feel like if Twitter was around back in the days, he wouldn't be wor- wearing the clothes he wears. It'd be, it'd be different clothes he would wear. Well, if Instagram was around for sure, yeah. <laughs> like, I don't want photos of that. <laughs> oh my gosh. So, okay, so books wise, uh, h- how many hours do you read and how many total books do you think you've read in your lifetime? I'm curious. Yeah, I mean, so it, the reason why it's a little hard for me to answer is it depends you know, whether I'm doing research or not, like when I'm working on a book, I might be reading a book a day, but like what reading means here is, is a little bit tenuous when you're talking about research, because you can be shooting through some things quickly and diving into other places. I would say I typically am reading about five or six books at a time. And I switch back and forth between them throughout the day, over the weeks, over the months. And some things I keep coming back to again and again, over a long period of time, some books I just read in a single day. Um, So I, probably spend about an hour a day reading, usually have five or six things I'm reading at a time. Um, So, you know, I've I've probably read a decent amount. I mean, I'm not, my friend Ryan Holiday kind of pushes this to an extreme, right? Where he, he, he reads like 20 books a month that he didn't give us big summaries of. I don't always hit that, but sometimes I do. Sometimes you hit 20 books a month. If I'm researching something for sure, right? Like if I'm writing an article for the New Yorker, for example, those are long form articles that are often like highly citational based. It's not uncommon that there might be six or seven books I need to go through just as a foundation for that particular article. Uh, if I'm writing a book chapter, the quickly go through six or seven books for that chapter is not, not unusual, right? So th- this stuff could really add up if you're, especially if you're doing research. Wow. Very impressive to see that. You, you wrote a book having to do with passion. You have strong opinions about passion. Because uh, we're living in a time right now where, you know, you hear a lot of motivational speakers saying, go chase your passion, you know, uh, oh, you drop everything. It doesn't matter if you're broke and you lose everything. As long as you are pursuing your passion, that's the way to go. Are they right? Yeah. So we're, we're going through the whole list of things that, that people are going to dislike me for. So we've, we've done social media. I don't like social media. We've done <laughs> cryptocurrency, right? I've, I've been mean about cryptocurrency. So yeah, let's go on to follow your passion. We're, we're, next, I'm going to talk about how soccer is dumb. I, I, that'll be it. And then we'll have, we'll have hit every topic that, <laughs> uh, yeah, I wrote a book in 2012 that argued follow your passion is bad advice, um, which was, uh, so here, I mean, okay. So here's the, the background behind that. Right, the background behind that point was when people say, follow your passion, like people who are living really interesting lives or whatever, what they often mean is follow the goal of ending up passionate about your work, right? Life is short. It's worth having your work be a real source of satisfaction, and which I think is really important, but then it gets simplified to the shorthand to follow your passion. And my argument in the book is, if you study how people actually end up passionate about their work, it's usually not what that simple advice says, right? It's usually not, I'm pre-wired to do this. Once I match that to my work, I'm passionate. It's usually a more complicated path with discovery and growth along the way. And so my argument is if we make the advice too simple, we actually hold people back from the destination that we all agree on. It's you cultivate passion for your work and it can be a complicated, rich and rewarding process and journey. Let's not simplify it down to, you are wired to be a social media brand manager for a, a major sports franchise. And until you get that job, you're going to be miserable. And then when you get that job, you'll love it because you were brave enough to follow your passion. It's a more complicated story. We should tell the more complicated story. Last but not least, you got a book coming out called World Without Email. Can you tell us about your book, World Without Email? Yeah, I mean, my argument in that book is the way we're working today is, is almost absurd. We spend almost all of our time in many office jobs, checking communication channels constantly inbox, Slack, 
teams, whatever it is that you use. And some of the data I cite is once every six minutes or more, we check in on one of these channels. And I argue, if we look at the neuroscience and psychology, you can't do anything useful with your brain in such an environment because the context shift that you generate when you turn your attention to an inbox and then try to turn it back to what you're working on is incredibly disastrous to your ability to concentrate. And so it's a terrible way to try to actually do knowledge work and people have to try to do their work in the early morning or in the evening and none of it makes sense. And so this book argues that that way of working was pretty arbitrary. Once email spread, and it spread for very good reasons, it was replacing fax machines and voicemails. Once email spread, in its wake, people started working in this way. We'll just figure everything out with back and forth messages real quick. It's killing our ability to actually work and it's making us miserable. The future of the world of work is going to say, we're going to have other ways of collaborating that's not just back and forth unscheduled messages. And we're all going to be much happier and get a lot more done. It's going to be more of a pain to figure out these new, you know, there'll be more hard edges, more systems, more rules. Sure. But what we're doing is so terrible that it's going to make everyone better off. That's the world without email I pitch. Not that the tool is going to go away. I don't want to fax anyone, but I'm not going to be using these hundreds of back and forth messages all day as the main way that I collaborate with people. Listen, if I ever see you becoming a massive Twitter, Facebook, Instagram star, or TikTok. Like if one of these, as I wake up and I'm reading an article on New York Times, TikTok superstar, Cal Newport, video okay. goes viral, 93 million views in two days, quoting how Socrates would use Twitter today. He is with us right now. And you got like a purple color yeah. hair with like three earrings and yeah. nose yeah. ring and tattoos. And you singing, got a, this, singing a sea shanty about yeah. how Socrates would not use Twitter. That would be wild. I can dancing. see that. I can, I can yeah. see you being a massive TikTok star um, where, you know, who knows? The, Dwayne Johnson calls you saying, we want to we want to have you in the next movie so your followers can watch it. I'm telling you, if that ever happens, uh, uh, I will be calling for a part two interview to say, what, why did you, why did you tell us this? That you, you, you got the star in you, you're hiding. You're not telling the rest of the world. First of all, you're, you're, a, you're a genius yourself. Second of all, you have the right values and principles and you're a social media superstar. You kept us all this uh, away from us. So I'm looking forward to that follow-up call to see you being on Instagram and Twitter. And I follow and click like when I see that picture. I don't know. Isn't that one of the signs of the apocalypse? It's, it's, it's the, there's the horseman, there's Cal Newport on TikTok. Like there's a couple signs that when you see him, you know, <laughs> the end is nigh. Yeah. I've really enjoyed talking to you. Listen, it, it, you know, there's a part of me that agrees uh, uh, and would uh, thinks many, many, many people would benefit from life. If they actually subscribe to your way of thinking, there are a lot of people that would benefit from it. I think a part of it also has to do with the business and the industry and career you choose to be a part of certain industries and careers. Like, you know, I was talking to a guy the other day who uh, came out and said, you know, remember the guy, Dan Price, who came out years ago saying, I'm paying all my employees $70,000 and I'm taking my income from $1.1 million a year uh, income to only 70 K. And all of a sudden his executives left and, but he was running a merchant account company. Everybody made 70 grand a year. And it was like the story got 500 million was most uh, viewed story ever on NBC. And I interviewed him two weeks ago and he and I were speaking and uh, I said, you know, Dan, you can do that in your industry. You can't apply that method in every industry. So maybe your approach works for you or Ryan Holiday. Ryan's on social, not as much as the rest of the guys. He is on social. He writes great books. Anything he comes out with, I'm the first to pick it up and have everybody in our company read it. Uh, I think Obstacle is the Way or Ego is the Enemy is excellent book. We've read it mul multiple times. I kind of see you guys as a, a similar place uh, that you think as Stoics. And I apply a lot of those thinking this way. So I'm not far off from where you're at, but there's a benefit to it on the business and to do, which helps the business I'm currently a part of. If I ever become a 4.7 GPA, MIT graduate, PhD, that I can go write books where I read six books to write one article for New Yorker, I'm going to contact you. I just want you to know this. I'm yeah, but I'll be on here. TikTok. I'll be on TikTok so I won't get your call. See that that's we're just gonna let's just swap this around. <laughs> well, buddy, appreciate you for your time, gang. We're gonna put the link below for World Without Email for you to go order it. And uh, I was gonna say if you want to reach out to him, go send him a message on Twitter, but you cannot find this guy. He's hiding, he's the hide and go seek champion of the world today. Cal Newport. Cal, thank you for your time. Well, thank you. I enjoyed it. Take care, buddy. Bye-bye. Can you see yourself never been on social media? Meaning like no Facebook, no Twitter, no YouTube, nothing, nothing socially, no Instagram. And would that benefit you in your life? 
and would allow you to make better decisions and spend more time reading and getting better. It's an interesting way of thinking. I definitely think we need more folks from his end to balance out those who are far right on one end with social media. Because if there is a philosophy today that would benefit many people that change my life, I'm a big Marcus Aurelius guy. I've read the book Meditations multiple times and the philosophy of Stoicism would benefit so many different people in business. If you've never looked into it, I did a video one time called Stoicism, the ancient philosophy for entrepreneurs. If you've never seen that before and you enjoy today's topic, I have a feeling you're going to enjoy this video that I did, uh, I think, last year or two years ago. Click over to watch the video. I want to hear your thoughts. Comment below. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.